you and I have similar backgrounds <laughs> where we began. So I believe in modeling. In other words, success leaves clues. If I look at the wealthiest people in the world and figure out whether their asset allocation, it would tell me a lot about where money should go. Most people think if somebody's a billionaire, they took these giant risks. And the truth is, if you become a billionaire that way, you don't stay a billionaire that way. The most successful investors in history all are obsessed with something called asymmetrical risk reward. All it means is they're trying to figure out how do I take the smallest amount of risk possible for the most amount of upside. That really got me excited. And one of the reasons I decided to write this third book is to show people this formula and show them how they could win. All right, guys, I am so honored and privileged to be able to, to do this interview today and to bring this to you because I cannot wait to dive into the incredible work that Tony Robbins is putting out into the world. Thank you so much for being here, Tony. Thank you, Candy. It's great to be with you. And I, I want to talk about the book. And I first just have to touch on, I know you've changed millions and millions of people's lives throughout your career and mine being one of them. I oh. listened to your personal power tapes when I was 15 years old. Wow. And six hundred dollars um, on a on a credit card from my little babysitting business, and wow. wrote my first set of goals when I was uh, fifteen, and achieved all of those, and now have gone on to to do so much of the work that you put out into the world. And from a girl on government assistance in a trailer that was abused as a child, like if your influence wasn't in my life, I truly wouldn't be where I am today. So, wow, well, that really touches my heart. Thank you for sharing that with me. I, you and I have similar backgrounds. <laughs> where we began. But I think sometimes uh, when you suffer in your childhood, if you don't stay suffering, it really makes you care for other people because you don't want them to suffer because you know what it feels like. And it also tends to create a hunger. And when people always ask me, what does it take to succeed? You met the most successful people on earth. What do they have in common? Well, I, I think intelligence is a great gift. I love wickedly smart people, but I'm sure you've experienced people are really intellectually smart, can't fight their way out of a paper bag in real life. What really matters is hunger. You know, if you're if you can have a hunger to be more, to do more, to give more, to share more, a hunger that doesn't end, not a hunger I'm going to lose weight to get you know into my outfit for the party kind of thing, but that ongoing hunger that is the one common denominator amongst all people. And you usually don't get that hunger if your childhood was perfect, but unless unless the hunger comes because there's something you want to serve more than yourself, and that's a beautiful thing. If you get both of those things, you have an everlasting drive. So I'm nice to know your background. I'm glad I was able to contribute in some way. But you know, when people say I changed their life. It's, not true. I've helped. That you're the one that did it. Um, but I'm really grateful to hear it was helpful to you. That's really when you said yeah. something. You've always said something that you said. If you would have had the mother that you had always wanted, you would never be the man that you are today. That's right. So many times in my life, I've held on to that. That if we had the the circumstances that we wanted in our life, we wouldn't be who we are. And so I just I want to get into the book, but I had to just touch on that because you've had such an impact in my life. So thank you so much. Thank you, Candy. That's beautiful. I really appreciate it. So you did money master the game. You did Unshakable. Now we've got the Holy Grail of investing, which is just incredible. Tell us who this is for and how it's maybe different from your prior two works. Well, it's interesting. I never planned to do a trilogy. <laughs> I don't desire to do any more. I'm not a, someone who enjoys writing books. But in 2008, when I saw everybody get destroyed, I mean, my billionaire clients had problems and my barber did. You know, I mean, literally every aspect of life. And so... Fortunately, I've been working with Paul Tudor Jones, one of the top financial traders in history uh, at this point for almost 25 years. And I learned so much from him. And I thought, you know, somebody's going to do something about these people that threaten the world economy. And the way we punish them is we gave them more money. It's just mind boggling to me. So I thought, you know, I'm only one guy, but I do have one gift. I have access because of what I do and at turning people around. I have access to the smartest minds in the world. So I said, let me interview 50 of the smartest financial people literally in the world, all self-made billionaires, nobody from the lucky sperm club, they didn't inherit it. And let's see how they did it and let's figure out what the principles are because they're all different. They're all investors, but some are macro investors, you know, trying to figure out where the world's going. Some are buying for value like a Buffett. And so I interviewed all of them and I, I found four principles I think would be worth just reminding your audience of. I mean, obviously you can't win financially if you don't get in the game. The question I was trying to ask initially is can you still win in an environment that can look very manipulated at times? And the truth is you absolutely can win. But first you gotta do is get in the game. You gotta stop being a consumer. You gotta become an owner, right? And so I explain all that in Money Master the Game. It's 670 pages. It's a monster. 
but I want to write a book that my billionaire clients would love, but also someone who never invested and doesn't think it's possible would know how to do it. And that's why the book has had such, uh, you know, it's been number one New York Times bestseller. It's the best-selling financial book of this century. The century is only 24 years old, but it's it's really had great impact. I wrote Unshakable because I knew the market's going to collapse. I didn't know when or how. No one knows that. But it's predictable. And when you've had that long a bull run, I knew there's going to be a challenge I want to prepare people. So I have no intention of writing another book. But here's what happened. In the first book, I'll give you four principles that are really simple that anybody who's going to ever get financially free has to do. What did all these people have in common? The first principle they all agreed on is so simple, and it's, um, it's anticlimactic, but it's important. And that is that all of them are obsessed not with making money, but not losing money. And you might say, well, it's because they're wealthy. No, that's not why. It's because they understand that assets, whether it's real estate, stocks, bonds, anything, it can drop 50%, and they do, in a day or a week. They go on forever, and then there's these moments. Well, if you lose 50% on an investment, how much do you have to make to get even? And most people say, well, 50%. <laughs> no, no, no. If you got a $100,000 investment, it drops to 50 and you only improve at 50%, that's, you're still in the hole. You have to make a 100% improvement, which takes time and energy. And so they know they can't afford to have that happen and win. So how do they not lose money? Because you know Warren Buffett has a frame, famous phrase, is, here's the rules to investing. Rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, see rule number one. Right? <laughs> but, but of course, everybody loses money investing at times. But to make sure you don't lose over the overall and you win in the long term, they do three other things. Number one, number two is they have asset allocation. Asset allocation is big words. All it means is if you had a thousand dollars to invest or a hundred million dollars to invest, the most important question the answer is not whether I'm going to buy Apple or Microsoft or this piece of real estate or that, because you're always going to make the wrong choices. The best investors make wrong choices or the wrong timing. What protects you from not losing money and allows you to win long term is your philosophy of investing, which means. Before you ever even look at a single stock bond piece of real estate, you have to decide what percentage of my money do I put in an environment that is low risk? And low risk means it's going to keep growing, but it'll also, because it's low risk, have lower returns. So it's kind of like the, tort the tortoise in the air. The tortoise wins the race. They're slow, but they win because they don't lose, right? Then how much are you going to put in a risk environment? Risk environment would be real estate. Risk environment would be stocks and things of that nature. And so things of that nature can go up, but you can also lose it all. And so there's a balance. And there's multiple things that affect how you make that decision. How old are you? If you're young, you can take a lot more in your risk bucket because if you mess up, you got time to make up for it. Uh, you know, if you're in a position where you're, you can deal with risk really well, maybe you could do a little more risk. If you are in a position where you have cash flow more than what it needs to cover your base every month, you can probably take a little more risk. So that's the philosophy that has to be resolved. So one of the reasons I wrote this third book is I got obsessed with saying, you know, I'm a big, I, I believe in modeling. In other words, success leaves clues. If I look at the wealthiest people in the world and figure out whether they're asset allocation, it would tell me a lot about where money should go. So I'm going to cover that in a second. Then the third thing that's more interesting that they all do is most people think if somebody's a billionaire, they took these giant risks and they had like, you know, uh, balls of steel, so to speak, <laughs> you know, real courage, craziness. And the truth is, if you become a billionaire that way, you don't stay a billionaire that way. If you like got lucky, the most successful investors in history all are obsessed with something called asymmetrical risk rewards, a bunch of big words. All it means is they're trying to figure out how do I take the smallest amount of risk possible for the most amount of upside. So, for example, uh, I have a friend, Kyle Bass, he took $20 million in 2008, the worst market in 80 years, and turned it into $2 billion in a year and a half. Now, how the hell do you do that? Because everybody thought more, you know, that real estate was going to continue to go up forever. There was overconfidence. He figured out that there was no way that these lousy mortgages were going to make it. And so he bet against them and he used some vehicles to do it. But here was the secret. He could be wrong 13 times and still make money. So he wasn't wrong 13 times. Paul Tudor Jones is one of my clients, one of the top 10 traders in the history of the world. He had a formula that he started out with, which is when I go to invest, I want to know that I believe I got a five to one. A five to one for him is his ideal. A three to one is the minimum. But a five to one is if I risk a dollar, I think it's really possible over time it's going to turn into five. That's great an investment. If I'm wrong, I can risk another dollar and I can make four. 
I could be wrong four times out of five and still be okay. That's asymmetrical risk reward. I'll give you one last quick example. Um, I was asking Kyle Bass, how would you explain this to like a child or someone who's not as financially sophisticated? And he goes, Tony, I worked on that for years for my kids. And about four months ago, he said, I figured it out. He said, I asked the question to myself uh, to help explain it to him. I said, where in the world is there an asset class that I can invest in that I can never lose money, which alone you say is crazy, right? And I'd have made money on day one that was significant. Now, most people say there's no such asset. But, you know, one of the great things about great investors or great people who are masterful at anything is they ask better questions, they get better answers. And so he kept asking and asking, and he finally came up and he goes, I found it out, nickels. I said, nickels? He goes, yes. If you buy nickels, they're always worth five cents and you never go down in value. But they cost 11 cents to make. They have 6.8 cents of value, smelt value. You want to wonder our government's upside down? They're spending twice as much to make a nickel as it actually is worth? He said, so they used to have pennies, used to have copper in them. Now there's almost no copper. And if you buy those pennies from before, those pennies are worth 200 to 300% more than what they were originally. He said, with nickels, I can buy nickels. They don't go down. And I've got a 30% upside on day one if I melt them. I said, yeah, but there's laws you can't melt the money. He goes, that's true. And I don't need to melt the money. He said, because the minute they make the change, guess what's going to happen? Those older nickels will be worth 100 or 200% more, but they're worth 30% right now. I know the value is there. He said, if I could push a button, make all my asset in nickels, I'd do it tomorrow. I have no downside, only upside from day one. So he wanted to teach his kids. So he called the Fed and he said, how many nickels can you, do you have on stock? And he bought 20 million nickels and had his kids stock it all up and take it there, right? I'll give you one more example. Uh, Richard Branson. He's a guy I have the privilege of knowing. And uh, he's a genius and he's crazy. Like he, you know, get on a balloon, get on a boat, get in the airplane. He risks his life all the time. But anybody who knows him personally knows he does not risk when it comes to investing. His question always is, what's the downside? How do we minimize the downside so the upside takes care of itself? So when he created Virgin Airlines, he's going to compete with British Air. Been around for decades, one of the most powerful organizations out there. Pretty risky. So here's what he did. He went to Boeing, his biggest expense is buying all these jets, you know? And he went to Boeing and said, look, I'm gonna buy X number of jets, 100 jets, I'm making the number up. But if I'm gonna do that, that's a big risk. You're gonna get a lot of sales. I want you to guarantee me that if a year and a half from now, I'm not profitable and I wanna end the company and return those back to you, I have no risk, no hit to my credit whatsoever. Took him a year and a half, he negotiated. So think about this. He starts in business now with no risk, only upside. That makes it a lot easier to succeed. So it's not always easy to get a symmetrical risk score, but I'm going to show you in a moment how you can do it. And then finally, number four is really simple. There's no free lunch except diversification. In other words, if you diversify, you don't want to just have, you know, all your money in one property, right? Or all your money in one stock. You've got to diversify across different assets, asset classes, even countries. So those are the four. After I was done with that, I read the book, Ray Dalio and I became friends, and I kept going deeper with Ray. And one day I said, look, out of all the things that you know in investing, 45 years in investing, he manages $195 billion, right? Most of anybody in history, he's the most successful anybody in history. I said, there's one principle that people, if they knew it, would change their investment lives. What would it be? And he said, Tony, I've worked for years to figure this out. I'm going to tell you what I call my holy grail, the holy grail of investing, which is the title of the book. And it comes from you. And I leaned forward. And I said, what is it? You know, and he said, I've discovered something interesting. He said, you always want to help people just beginning the journey, Tony. And I work with a lot of sophisticated investors. And there are people that are older there or late to the journey. So there's, how are they going to get to their goals? Well, they're going to have to put a lot more money in, which not everybody has, or they have to get higher returns. But to get higher returns, you got to take higher risk. And higher risk could mean, at some point, losing it all because every asset class Real estate, stocks, bonds, everything drops 50 to 70% at some point. And you've been seduced because maybe you've done it for a year or a decade or two decades and you've been successful. So you think it's always going to be that way. And then all of a sudden you lose everything. He said, so I discovered something. I discovered a way to get the highest returns with the least risk possible. And it's simple math. I said, what is it? He said, if you can find eight to 12 uncorrelated investments you can reduce your risk by 80% and have the same upside or greater. 
Now, reducing your risk 80% is like, that is the, that is the holy grail, right? And so he explained to me how it works, but in case your audience doesn't know, because it's a term, right? Uncorrelated. Most people know that when certain things like a tech industry, they all go up together, they all tend to go down together. Maybe there's some variation, but it affects it. A rising tide lifts all boats, a dropping tide brings all them down. Veritable. If you're, if the stock market, if you know, the economy is going great, people want to go to the stock market because that's the highest return. If it's not going great, they want to have bonds to protect them because it's a guaranteed return, right? Not as high, but guaranteed. So they're usually uncorrelated. But in 2022 and 2008, they both crashed. And if you go to your broker, they're going to go, I don't know, this never happens. It actually happens regularly during big crashes. So we don't need to go into detail of that, but this is the solution to that. So I was all excited about this. And then about three months later, I was at JP Morgan and they were they have a conference once a year that's for alternative investments. And you have to be a billionaire to go. And I was one of the speakers and Ray was right before me. And somebody asked him a similar question and he gave the same formula. And I watched every head in the room, multi-billionaires drop their head and write like crazy. So it's so simple. So now the question then is, how do you do that? Because most of the things in the world tend to get correlated to that. And so I was really frustrated. And then I came across something really interesting. I began to realize, oh my gosh, there's all, there used to be 8,000 stocks. Now there's only 3,700. But 98% of all companies of 100 million or more are privately held. And then I found a statistic that blew my mind. 35 years in a row, 35 straight years, private equity, these are the people that buy private companies and they know how to build them up, new CEO, change the marketing, cut the cost, whatever, and then they sell it to a bigger company or they take it public. Those companies have produced greater returns than every stock market in the world every year for 35 straight years. So I'll give you an example. Most people know the S&P 500, it's the index of the top 500 companies in the stock market, right? Well, if you put your money in the S&P 500 for the last 35 years, it's average 9.2% a year on average compounded. So that means if you're getting 5% a year, you probably know it takes 14 and a half years to double your money. When you're doing, you know, 9%, it's going to take you only eight years. Big difference in doubling your money. But the average, you know, when I wrote this book, I interviewed 100, excuse me, I interviewed 13 of the greatest financial investors in private equity, private credit, private real estate. But they have like one of them has a hundred billion dollar fund to give you an idea. These are the best on earth. They all average 20% or more for decades. One guy is 36% compounded for 26 straight years. Average private equity has averaged 14.2 versus the 9.2. Well, that's interesting. No, it's more than interesting. It means you're making 50% more money every year compounded. So to help your audience understand in real simple terms, I'll take a wild number. Let's say you put a million dollars in the stock market 35 years ago and did nothing. It's worth $26 million today. But if you took the same million dollars and you put it private equity for the same period, it's $139 million. So that's why when you talk about asset allocation, when you look at the ultra wealthy, 46% of their money on average is in private equity, private credit, private real estate, only 29% is in the public market. So you need the public markets because they have liquidity. But that really got me excited. And one of the reasons I decided to write this third book is to show people this formula and show them how they could win. Oh my gosh, that's unbelievable. And I think that if everyone listening can even understand those differences so they can start to look for opportunities in these other markets. And maybe we can speak for a second for the people that maybe are saying, you know what, well, I'm not a billionaire and I don't have a $100 million company but I'm scared. I see what's going on. We're coming into an election cycle. I see what's going on on the world stage. Um, I am worried about what to invest in. Can you maybe like, let's say if you woke up tomorrow and everything that you had, Tony, all of your companies, all of your wealth, all of the connections that you had were just gone and they evaporated. And the only thing you could retain is all this information that you've built over your career and in all of these books. What are some of the first things that you would do to start to build it back? knowing what you know, but not leveraging what you have. Well, the first, the first thing I do is I decide, I do my homework, and what you'll learn is that in the stock market alone, the public markets alone, over any long period of time, you're going to win. You look at any period of time, you know, on average, any year, any year, you have a 75% chance of making money. That's pretty good on any year. That's the average. Over a 10-year period, it's ridiculous. You're going to make money. Over a 20-year period, there's no question. That's why you, you talk to people like Warren Buffett, they go, buy the index, 
and stop paying attention to the markets going up and down because these markets have done well during World War One, World War II, pandemics, everything you can imagine. The overall trend is still up, but if you watch it in the middle, you'll sell and be crazy. So I would look at my asset allocation, but then I'd look at these areas that aren't going to go up and down as much. So here, here's what's really cool. If you look over the last 35 years, not only has private equity been something that has had the greatest returns, but it's had the least amount of volatility because when, let me explain. These people are buying companies. They know how to make them better, grow them, add value, and then sell them. They can take them public or private to a bigger company. These companies don't have to sell when the market drops. So th when the market drops, they make money. They buy things. When the market's great, they sell things. Because when you give them your money, it's a long-term investment. Most people do not do well in the stock market because they see you going crazy. They push a button and can sell. They do well in their real estate because they can't push a button and sell when things come up and down, right? Well, these guys type their money for five years and people are willing to do it because the returns are so much greater. But here's why I wrote the book also. I should clarify these types of investments in the past have only been for wealthy people. In fact, the government keeps you from having access to the best investments unless you're called an accredited investor. That means you have a million dollar net worth or you make at least $200,000 a year in income. Well, so when I first learned these things, I got excited. I saw I could get all these new different types of investments. I could have these incredible returns, but it's like I can help my wealthy friends help the average person. And here's what's so exciting why you want to pick up the book. Congress, the House, just passed a law that allows you to become an incredible investor without a million dollars, without 200000 if you just do one thing. You have to make a test. Now, Senate is picking it up. It'll take another couple of months for them to pass it, but it's bipartisan. It looks really good already. Congress has already done it. It'll allow you to take a test, and then you'll have access to these same investments you could do in small increments, just like you could with a stock. Only the returns have consistently been better than anything in the public markets for the most part, certainly on the averages. So think about this. It's a world that never existed. It'll become a world that your 401k will be able to use. But you got to know what's available. And here's what's really exciting. Really, really exciting. I, you know, I, I got no point financially. I was doing well and I've got a great reputation. And what I've done, I know a lot of people. But the very best people, the ones that are in this book, it'd be, you just couldn't get access to because... I could get access to some of them, a little small amount, because it's already pre-sold. It's like, if you want to buy an SP3 Ferrari, they're $4 million, and you don't care how much money you have. You can't buy it because the best ones are already bought by everybody. They're pre-ordered by other Ferrari dealers or Ferrari owners, right? Or like going in a club with a velvet rope. You got money, but if you don't know the right people, you're not attractive enough, you're, you're never going to get past that, but that rope still. So I was frustrated that I could get in some of them, but not enough. And I was sitting down one day, and this is what changed my life and the other reason I wrote this book. And I'm sitting with a friend of mine who used to work with Paul Tudor Jones, a brilliant guy. And he started his own firm, super successful guy. And I was talking about my frustration of these things are like pre-sold, you know? It's like they go to sovereign wealth funds. They go to pension funds. The best. I want to get in the best, but I want a bigger slice. He says, Tony, I'm going to share with you where I put all of my money. He said, this will blow your mind. He said, the majority of my money... I put into this firm in Houston, Texas called CAS. And I was like, Houston, you know, if you're not going to be sophisticated financially, it's like London, Singapore, New York, Connecticut, Houston. He goes, Tony, they're doing something totally unique. He goes, what if I told you? You don't have to fight to get to be an investor in one of those funds. When you invest in one of those funds, they call you a limited partner, by the way. It's the language of it. But if you own the company, you're this, you know, the CEO, the C-suite, you're called a general partner. And those general partners have an income stream way beyond one fund. They have all the funds. And when you give money to them, they are guaranteed 2% of your money. That's the charge per year, whatever you invest in for five years. Now, why would people do that? Well, because the upside is so large. They also get 20% of the upside that they grow for you. So it's not uncommon for like a small fund would be a billion dollars. The funds here are, are 20 to $100 billion funds. But if you had a billion dollars, and you grow it and you double it in five years, which is not uncommon in these companies. Well, they make the 2% makes them $100 million of guaranteed income for five years, of which as an owner, you get. In addition, they'll make on the next billion, 200 million. They'll make $300 million on a billion dollars. And I say, what industry has the most billionaires? People go, tech, no, real estate, no. It's financial services, but it's not hedge funds. They go up and down. It's these private equity firms, the best of them. So, he said, you can own a piece, a little slice, 
and you're going to be some multiple firms. So today I own 65 different firms and I get the two and 20. So I make about 10% of the money in cash flow plus these giant returns that have grown. It's one of my favorite investments. There's another one. People buy, used to try and buy bonds and, you know, they produce nothing. Now you can get 4%, you know, a little bit ago it was 5%, but it fluctuates. For years, it's been so low. So people want guaranteed income. And so you're getting no return. So people have started buying junk bonds. Well, junk bonds, they call high yield bonds, we're paying in 2021 3.9%. Well, compared to one and a half, that sounds like a lot, but it's ridiculous. And it's big risks. These are companies that are risky companies. And that industry went up and collapsed during 2021. At that same time, I was in private credit. Private credit is since 2008, and of course, with these regional banks, the banks have tightened their lending. And most companies are in the $100 million to $3 billion range. And they don't get the financing they need. So these private equity firms, they know how to vet companies better than anybody. So they make the loans to them. Well, guess what? Their loans are floating rate loans, like all business loans. If you have a mortgage that's fixed at 3%, you don't mind interest rates going up. But if you didn't, and you're now paying seven instead of three, you're paying two and a half times more for the same house. Well, guess what? Our private credit firms have a 1% failure rate. No bank on earth has that. They've died for that. And they loan again and again to these companies. They need cash flow. And guess what? Those 5 and 6% loans, which is what business loans were, were floating. So when interest rates went up, now we're getting 12 and 13% for some of those loans. No more risk, the unbelievable returns, and we get the two and 20. I'll give you one last one because then we're running out of time. People dream sometimes of going, wouldn't it be incredible if you own a sports team, but that's a fantasy. I grew up dirt poor, and I want to be a professional baseball player. And by the time I got to high school, I discovered that I did not have enough skill to, to make it in the major leagues. So I would buy tickets to go to Dodger Stadium and, you know, the right field, highest thing, cheapest tickets, the only way I could do it. And I'd bleed Dodger blue. Now I own a piece of the Dodgers. But it started with me trying to buy a sports team with a group of investors. I helped to start and invest in the LAFC football club, the soccer team there, built the stadium. We did all these things. It was fun. I moved to Florida and I never got to go to a game, but we won a championship. It was fun, right? But it's like, it, it took years to get to that. And then it took about a year of going through a microscope of approval. Well, three years ago, the rules were changed in Major League Baseball, NBA, Major League Hockey, and Major League Soccer. And they made it possible for a few firms who can help you through a fund to actually own multiple pieces of different sports teams. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, it's fun, but here's a major reason. It's not tied to inflation or the stock market. These sports teams have done well in World War I, World War II, pandemics, everything, and they keep on growing. You have a monopoly, a legal monopoly. No one can compete with you in that city. Thirdly, you have customers called fanatics. That's where the word fan comes from, multi-generational. And it used to be putting butts in seats. When inflation goes up, you charge more for odd dog, people pay for it, no problem. But they're now, they're media organizations and they're real estate organizations. So for example, the LA Dodgers, my friend and my partner, Peter Gruber, he and with a group of partners, Magic Johnson, other people bought the Dodgers a few years back. They paid $2 billion for the Dodgers. Well, that's kind of out of the price point to me and probably most of the people watching your show. But I know Peter, and I'm, you know, I might well get a slice of this. We're going to find out. But I'm like, $2 billion. Every sports commentator, every news commentator is like, no one's paid more than $800 million for a baseball team. The Dodgers are amazing, but they're not worth more than a billion dollars. They're overpaying by a billion dollars. So I go to Peter. I said, Peter, I know everyone's telling you're nuts. I know you're not nuts. How you doing it? He said, Tony, he, he's made 52 Academy Award made uh, nominated films to give you an idea. He goes, I'm going to leave you on the cliffhanger because I love that. Come to me Tuesday night. You'll hear the announcement. We'll have a little dinner. We'll have a party. We'll celebrate. Tuesday, they announced. When you own a sports team, NBA, Major League Baseball, you get an equal share of the national media. So you can be the worst team and you still get your 130th, for example, of, of the teams. But you keep your local sports rights. Peter sold the local sports rights for the LA Dodgers for $7 billion, paid only $2 billion for the team, made $5 billion that day. If Michael Jordan bought the Charlotte Hornets, no, Hornets again, uh, 11 and a half years ago for $275 million, he just sold it for $3 billion to a group of people, including our investors, my team. And we think it's a great deal, but can you imagine his return? I mean, it's just unbelievable. And he you know, still owns a piece of the team, to give you an idea. So you can own a little piece of these teams. So I own a piece of 
you know, the Dodgers and the Boston Red Sox, you know, through this time. I owned a little piece over here of, you know, the Golden State Warriors and the Utah Jazz, right? So it's a really cool piece. So in the book, I explain to you all these different assets, how you can participate, even if you're early on stage, what you're doing, or what things you might want to set goals for either way. And then I give you half the book is the interviews with the smartest people on earth. So I don't care what level investing you are, showing you how they built their businesses, how they grew, how they invest. I mean, it's amazing. And the book I've way, like all you know, three of my number one bestsellers in my past ones, I gave away 100% of the money to Feeding America. So this book will feed people while you're feeding yourself for the future as well. Because 100% of it goes to Feeding America. Well, thank you so much for doing this, for putting this out there, because you're literally at a place in your life that you don't have to write another book. You don't have to speak on another stage, but you are continuing to just pour into all of us and to people that that really just need this this help and this support. And so I just thank you so much for doing this, guys. We're going to put all the links, the holy grail of investing. Run, don't walk, grab your copy. Tony, thank you so much for just not just your time here, but who you are in the world and to me and to so many of our listeners. Um, you're just truly a gift from God in so many people's lives. And so I just want to thank you for being you and still showing up for all of us. Thank you, Kenny. You're so kind. 